Well, first of all, we have uh, some kind of uh, a very good combination of uh, domestic and international third parties in our different mechanisms. I think that's one of the innovations that um, uh, in our peace agreement, uh, perhaps not done in most other peace agreements. For instance, in a lot of the uh, the facilitative or mediation bodies that we put up or the monitoring bodies, it's a combination of local and domestic actors, third party actors, international NGOs and domestic NGOs and uh, as well as governments coming in to sit in different variations. There's the international contact group which is made up of states and international NGOs and they sat, observed the negotiations proper and they helped sort out some kinks along the way as we went along in the negotiations they help the parties process what's going on and uh, you know find ways out of impasses uh, in the international monitoring team we have a very interesting combination of uh, governments fil uh, fielding monitors to monitor the ceasefire and to sort of act as preventive mechanisms and at the same time we put in domestic NGOs and, um, and international NGOs in the civilian protection component. So it's it's that kind of uh, mix. The facilitator, of course, is a government uh, facilitator from a third country, which is Malaysia. And uh, that helped also uh, sort of uh, get the discussion going in the actual negotiation. So this is the role of the facilitator, that they so sort of sit there and moderate and see that uh, things keep moving forward. So it's very good to have uh, third parties. Um, initially the process was purely domestic. Uh, no international actors involved, all third parties. Uh, very limited role and mostly domestic. But afterwards, because of the on and off process, um, uh, it became necessary, uh, especially on the part of the MLF, to, uh, to involve third parties. And the government saw the merit in that process. So they were more eager to have I think we can understand why the uh, the non-state armed group would be more eager to have uh, domestic uh, interna third parties whether domestic or international to sort of serve as buffer mm -hmm. and to a certain extent uh, guarantees although of course there are no uh, no more significant guarantors of peace process than the direct parties themselves but they sort of supplement that they provide that kind of um, uh, a momentum as well as some kind of a buffer to ensure that the process is moving and the government should have to understand that it's not as if you you legitimize the, the armed group in itself by involving third parties I mean the legitimacy comes out of the process of really seriously talking peace and uh, being committed to whatever is agreed on so we know that like during the peace processes it's very difficult to affect the public opinion in a, in a direction that is amenable to the to, to, for the peace. Yeah. So, like for like, what do you think? Like, what were the like most important mechanisms or events that affected the public opinion in favor of peace? Uh, public opinion evolves, and it can change quickly, or it can change or it could take a really long time to change public opinion and there are historical reasons for that there are um, conjunctural situations like election cycles actually you know skew skew mm -hmm. public opinion because everything gets sort of uh, very uh, short-sighted the public discourse get very short-sighted to getting elected getting people elected and, and so on but otherwise uh, we all know that uh, we have different different constituencies. Government has its constituency. When it talks to the public, it has to speak as government representing the whole country. And we understand with, that when the, the other party, the armed group, talks to its public, it would have its own discourse. Mm -hmm. Important to keep its own public supportive of the process. So, you, you know, uh, there are there are different, different ways that uh, uh, public opinion is eventually shape. Uh, 
uh, social media is a powerful tool but it's also easily manipulated we know about trolls <laughs> including paid ones and uh, a lot of misinformation actually goes there so uh, one of our mo uh, biggest difficulty is actually to correct the misinformation about the agreement there have been a lot of lies told about the agreement so we even came up with uh, uh, pamphlets talking about the 12 uh, the myths about the peace agreement because you had to pull back all the misinformation that's coming out and all of these misinformation are actually being manipulated by um, by groups of politicians who have vested interest in the process and do not want it to succeed or are using it as some kind of a populist platform uh, because this is not exactly a very popular process I mean you're dealing with a conflict that has divided the country for a long time people's opinions are polarized there are biases and pre prejudices historical as well as the contemporary context of you know, Islamophobia for instance op also operates in our in our country so it, it's like uh, it's it's uh, it's very easy to, uh, to tweak or to press certain buttons and you get that kind of a very negative uh, public opinion uh, working against you against the whole process so so necessarily we did have to do a lot we it, it was necessary to do a lot of public consultations a lot of media campaigns and civil society organizations uh, who were supportive of the process uh, were very important um, actors in uh, in being able to reach out to grassroots communities and also to to serve as other voices speaking in support of the peace process because the two parties the government and the armed group cannot do all the you know cannot be the only voices speaking for their peace process or for their peace agreement there has to be that kind of a wider circle of voices speaking out and uh, you need peace ambassadors to do that you know you need we, earlier we were discussing about artists famous people um, uh, academics maybe in our case when we talk about constitutional issues you need former Supreme Court justices speaking out saying that this is precisely what the Constitution mandated that you come up come to a peace agreement where you put in place meaningful autonomy and all of this all of these voices have to be generated because uh, it's not something that the two parties after all it's not only for the two parties it's supposed to be for the whole country mm -hmm. and even international actors in, in our situation when we got into a very difficult moment um, we had the international community speaking in support because they had you know they're they they know they know what's going on in the rest of the world they know how important it is to have peace even in only one part of the world and not create a condition where uh, in the whole world where the, there are actually you know the so so much so much conflict going on and uh, uh, that kind of uh, radicalization taking place uh, especially the, given the fact that we are talking about an Islamic population a minority population in our country and radicalization is already there so uh, even the international community is a voice in this whole process but at, at the end of the day it's really the domestic voices that really count because mm -hmm. this is the domestic audience that you need to convince to support your process so you're the first woman uh, <laughs> chief peace negotiator that attended to a, like a peace negotiation isn't that terrible <laughs> that all this time uh, not too men not enough women have been given the chance to show that they can do it as well of course it doesn't mean that uh, well only a woman can do it precisely because this is the first time that a woman actually played that kind of role but uh, which means that men have been doing it although not there have not been enough peace uh, signed peace agreements we wish there could be more but it shows that women has to be part of this equation because they can bring in something new and we did bring in something that uh, might not have been there if only men were negotiating but and can you elaborate a bit on that like what do you <laughs> think like women uh, bring more on the table and also like what kind of mechanisms you develop to secure that women are a part of, uh, of the peace process mm -hmm. and they like specific demands yes. are, are met like how, how did you deal with, uh, with this like big question so mechanisms one was we had to expand the room 
because in on, in the case of the MILF, they had an all-male panel, all-male secretariat, and it will be difficult for them to dis disturb that that kind of uh, setup because they they had to contend with ethnic representation. Uh, the Bangsamoro is made up of different ethnic groups, and their panels were made up of different ethnic groups who happened to be or who were also ma all male. And the only way that they could bring in more women was to open up the room for more consultants. And when we started talking about the, the different annexes that we had to do, we created technical working groups and that, that allowed them to bring in more women. Of course, we also brought in more women as well. Uh, like um, of four technical working groups, um, uh, three were chaired by women on the part of government. On In their case, again, uh, technical working groups were chaired by men but they were able to bring in more uh, women consultants uh, to participate in the process so that's one mechanism if there's no woman in the room create more space where you can bring in more women uh, provide them with funds so that they can participate mm -hmm. uh, or work with women's organizations in, a, in my case uh, I have a natural network with civil society organizations and women's groups as well mm -hmm. so we did need them also to help us convince uh, the negotiators on both sides to bring in more of the women's agenda on in the table and in, in, in the agreement as well. So if you look at our agreement, you will find that there are very important provisions there dealing with women. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a product of the fact that women were involved in the peace process because otherwise this will be treated like, you know, uh, peripheral issues. Mm -hmm. There are hard issues on the table and this is a soft issue. Mm -hmm. But of course that is not necessarily the case because all of the hard issues issues actually have gender uh, dimensions uh, so that had to be put on the table and I think one of the biggest uh, biggest achievement that we saw in in that kind of process because the MILF initially resisted the fact that they will be negotiating with a woman chair right uh, this is something new in their experience but what we see now is that they have been that they have changed their minds they are actually using even gender sensitive language I can see that in the negotiators and that means that uh, women have succeeded in this process when you have actually put in the agenda and you have changed the consciousness of the leaders and but you have to carry that on to the ground make sure that at the ground level the women are not left behind as well and they have to do it themselves as well because you cannot people from the outside cannot fight all the battles for the women on the ground that's why you see now a lot of initiatives that enable women on the ground to actually participate through a lot of all women events which are still necessary because uh, you need to create spaces for women to discover their own uh, their own capabilities and actually to make them already to prove that they can play important roles in their own communities you have you need to provide them with those spaces and the chance to be able to do that and that's a continuing thing even if you have not really concluded the implementation what we can see is that kind of uh, flowering of um, civil society uh, initiatives on the ground and that include women's organizations taking part or doing different kinds of things that are all uh, components or you know pieces of the puzzle that will need to be put together to construct or to reconstruct Bangsamoro society. I have one last question. <laughs> yes. So, like in the panel, you said that there isn't a, like a fixed solution for all the conflicts around the mm -hmm. world. So, like also like considering the particular particularities of the Turkish case, like what do you think? I mean, I don't want to ask this this way, but like what kind of lessons mm -hmm. um, Turkey can get from the because like Turkish state was a, like yeah. a, was part of the the process in the Philippines. So, like what should Turkish state, the society, like in general, Turkish society should be yes. from the, the example in Philippines. Well, one is don't think it's not possible to find a way out, a peaceful way out of a very violent conflict. And the first step to do that is to start to see each other as human beings again. And to see that there are many sides to the issue, that there is not only one side, not only one side is wrong, not only one side is correct, and to start a dialogue process among communities. Uh, and communities have to establish also a sense of 
autonomy from both parties mm -hmm. so that they can become uh, make, they can become effective interlocutors of both the government and the non-state armed group mm -hmm. because there has to be that kind of uh, uh, a real dialogue taking place uh, both ways uh, and civil society is probably the ones uh, who are in a good position especially on the ground because they can talk to the armed group and then at the national level they can talk to the government so they have they, they can serve as a bridge and as an independent actor that and uh, that forces both parties to see the other side of the coin because if they're lo only looking at one side of the coin you need other people to point this out to them mm -hmm. that it's not only their rights that are being violated or their their uh, that they are actually part of the problem and therefore they should also start seeing themselves as you know seeing to see seeing what about themselves they have to change what policies they need to reconsider in order to open a path, a new path that will bring them away from the violence. But it takes a lot of thinking, rethinking, and civil society can help them in that rethinking process. We were there. Uh, we were there before we got where we are now. It, it wasn't easy. Um, uh, but that kind of paradigm shift will have to happen and everybody has to contribute to that paradigm shift. But you need, of course, the parties to eventually get there.